Group's Cyber uh, Homeland Security uh, Working Group. Uh, and it's my privilege this afternoon to introduce the next session. It is uh, with great interest of the theme of this uh, session, which is about to begin. It's entitled, A Look Over My Shoulder, colon, The Director of National Intelligence Reflects and Foreshadows. We know that the threats to this country, they go beyond cyber threats and Russian interference are increasing. I was once a National Intelligence Officer for a warning. And I also found that warning really is something that appeals to me, looking around the corner, seeing what may happen, uh, not just today, but tomorrow, to try to anticipate the black swans that are going to hurt or be inflicted upon our nation. In my view, uh, the next, this session will get at those issues away from the tactical world and the whirly-burly of just today's events. It is my great pleasure also to introduce the moderator uh, of this session, Andrea Mitchell. She's familiar not only to the Aspen Security Forum and this audience, but she's familiar with all Americans. Where there's a crisis that involves foreign affairs, you know that Andrea Mitchell is always there. Andrea is, of course, uh, she is uh, a chief foreign correspondent for the uh, NBC. And she also hosts Andrea Mitchell Reports for MSNBC. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Troy Allen. <laughs> Thank you to the Aspen Security Forum. Thank you, Director. Uh, it's great to have you here. There is a lot at stake. Uh, no one knows this more than you, so let's get right to it. Uh, I want to start with Russia. We'll move on to a lot of the other threats, the things that you're looking about the world. But let's talk with Russia. You did something really extraordinary on Monday. Moments after the president appeared to be siding with Vladimir Putin over you, you personally, by name, you stood up and spoke out. I'm wondering, why did you do that? <laughs> I'm not surprised we're starting with Russia. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was just doing my job. Uh, as I expressed to the president on my th third visit to the Oval Office uh, as his new principal advisor, um, I said, Mr. President, there will be times when I will have to bring news to you that you don't want to hear. Um, I just want you to know that the news I bring to you, the information I bring to you, uh, will be to the best extent that we can uh, be unvarnished, uh, non-politicized, uh, the best that our incredible intelligence agency can produce so that you will have the information you need to make the policy decisions that you're going to be faced with. And on that basis, uh, we started a, a good relationship. Um, I just felt at this time, point in time uh, that um, what we had assessed uh, and reassessed and reassessed and carefully gone over um, uh, still stands, uh, and that it was important to take that stand on behalf of the intelligence community and on behalf of the American people. Um, as we have seen, uh, the president has uh, um, made statements uh, relative uh, to uh, uh, in support of that, uh, which I appreciate, the latest being on, on uh, I think, uh, one of your rival networks. Um, give you the privilege of not naming them, so uh, keep NBC in front here. Um, so th therefore, um, it was a part of uh, my role, I, and I felt that it was important that I do that. It has been said, it has been discussed uh, personally with the president, and um, I think uh, it's time to move on. Well, except that the president has made so many conflicting statements. Uh, he has switched from one position to the other even in the same day as recently as yesterday. And I'm wondering, when you watched that in Helsinki, what was your gut reaction watching him validate Vladimir Putin's assessment over yours? Well, my thoughts there were that I uh, believed I needed to correct uh, the record. 
uh, for that, uh, and uh, that uh, this is the job I signed up for, uh, and that was my responsibility. Um, obviously, I wished he had made a different statement, uh, but I think that now that has uh, been uh, clarified um, uh, based on his uh, uh, late reactions uh, uh, to this. And so um, um, I, don't, I don't think I want to go any further than that. Well, in the cabinet room, one of the statements that you refer to, his clarifications, he said, I accept our intelligence community's conclusion that Russia's meddling in the 2016 election took place. Could be other people also. Could be other people also? What does he know that you don't know? Well, could is not a, a definitive uh, uh, word here that, uh, I mean, could someone else be looking at how to do this uh, relative to our elections, uh, possibly rogue states, whatever? Uh, we know others have potential capability, but it's undeniable that the Russians are taking the lead on this. Uh, basically, they are the ones that are trying to undermine our basic values, uh, divide us uh, with our uh, allies. They are the ones that are trying to wreak havoc over our election process. We need to call them out on that. It's critical that we do so um, and to then take steps to make sure that they are not able to do this with the election coming up. Learn the lessons from the past. Put in place the, uh, the things that we need to put in place in terms of making sure that we can guarantee to the American public when they walk in that voting booth and cast their vote, however they cast it, it is a valid vote. It will not be tampered with. And whatever result comes from these elections, is something the American people can have confidence in, that it was not manipulated by anyone, whether that was externally or internally. We know politically uh, there have been times when uh, parties have tried to manipulate uh, the, the votes one way or another. That just simply is not acceptable. The very pillar basics of, of democracy is the ability to have confidence in your elected officials that they were elected legitimately, and we have to take every effort uh, to ensure that that, makes, that that happens in this upcoming election um, and future elections. And just to nail this down, the, ninth, the uh, 2017 intelligence assessment of the community, the findings said Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump. 18 months later, has anything changed that would make it more or less certain that it was Vladimir Putin? in charge of that? Well, I don't want to get, get too far into what the investigation that's going on and what they may uh, produce from that. We but in terms of the intelligence assessment? Well, we just continue to provide intelligence uh, that we uh, achieve uh, relative to our customers, uh, which is the president, which are the policymakers in the White House, uh, which is our oversight committees in the House and the Senate. Uh, and that basis, that is available uh, to them. Um, and, and we, will keep, we will keep doing that. Uh, relative to uh, what's, what's coming in 2018, as uh, Director Nielsen said this morning, DHS does not have evidence of the fact that uh, anywhere near what happened in 2016. However, despite that, we absolutely have to, cannot just rest on that assumption. Uh, as I mentioned in my speech at Hudson just a week ago or so, um, it's just one click of the keyboard uh, that could change this narrative. And so we have to be ever vigilant uh, on this, and I, I think we have to be relentless in terms of calling out the Russians for what they've done. We have to be vigilant in terms of putting steps in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. More transparency we can have relative to this issue, the better. Men and women who work for you are working around the clock. They are. Around the world and putting their lives on the line in many right. cases to make sure that our democracy is safe. What do you say to them when the president disavows their work or others in our government, disavows their work and criticize their work? I say to our uh, people most around the world and, and in the seven, 16 agencies uh, uh, within the United States, I say to them, we are professionals. We are here to provide professional service to our government. We need to keep our heads down. We need to go forward with the wonderful techno technological capabilities that we have to produce intelligence. Um, 
there's a lot of swirl, political swirl going around. Um, just do your jobs. Our goal is to make unpoliticized information necessary for our policymakers to make good decisions. And so try to, put, try to get up every morning, go to work, do your job. If you have thinking in one way or another way relative to a plus or a minus, set that aside. You go home and think about it, whatever. But the work that product that you are putting together has to be absent from any kind of political manipulation. In Helsinki, the president was alone with Vladimir Putin for two hours, more than two hours, with only translators. Basically, how do you know what happened? You were on the dark side of the moon. How do you have any idea what happened in that meeting? Well, you're right. I don't know what happened in that meeting. Um, uh, I think uh, as time goes by, and the president has already mentioned some things that happened in that meeting, I think we will learn more. But that is the president's prerogative. Um, uh, if he had asked me uh, how that ought to uh, be conducted, I would have suggested a different way. Uh, but that's not my role. That's not my job. So um, uh, it is what it is. Is there a risk that Vladimir Putin could have recorded it? That risk is always there. Is there a risk that the soccer ball could have been wired? <laughs> uh, was that a World Cup soccer ball, or was that a, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we have ability to measure those kinds of things and determine whether or not they, they I are I kind of figured you not. did. In fact, Every time I come home with, uh, you know, there's a, there's a limit to what they can give you if you meet with your foreign adversaries. All that has to go through the radar and processes and is it less than $20 or whatever. You know, so I'm sure that soccer ball has been looked at very carefully. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet you looked at that big letter from Kim Jong-un that was brought right into the Oval yeah. Office. And also, that was really uh, something else. Uh, today, the White House said that the president now disagrees with Vladimir Putin's offer to question Ambassador McFaul and others, other Americans, other diplomats. Uh, as a former ambassador, are you dismayed that it took the president three days to come to that conclusion? Andrea, I, you know, I don't know how to answer questions uh, like that. I, uh, my focus now is on what's happening around the world, the threats that are facing the American people, the threats that undermine our democracies. Um, that's what I was hired to do. Uh, I can't focus. Uh, you know, when I was uh, a policymaker in the Congress, um, I uh, we uh, we like to think, you know, as senators, we have an answer for everything, even though we don't. But uh, we like to think that. Uh, now I'm in a completely different job. Um, I spent a lifetime trying to get my name in the paper and back at home. Uh, you know, so people would vote for me, remember the name when they went into the voting booth. I'm in a job now where it's just the opposite. I like to, sp I like to spend my lifetime not being in the paper, uh, not having my picture or, or words. Uh, I do very few of these types of... I know. Uh, We're very grateful to you yeah. for the, today. It's attractive to... It's hard to say no to an invitation to Aspen, uh, <laughs> especially in the hot summer of, of, of uh, Washington, D.C. But um, uh, I just, you know, try to keep my focus where it needs to be. And so um, I just, there's just some things I just don't get into. Well, let's focus on your warnings. On Friday, you warned that, the, well, you said the warning lights are blinking red again, as they were before 9-11 on terror threats. You were speaking about cyber. I was. You said Russia was the most aggressive of the, of the foreign actors in cyber. By far. In what way? What does it mean in terms of the attacks, the frequency of attacks, successful attacks? It means we're under attack in many, many ways. Our, our financial institutions, our uh, critical infrastructure, um, uh, our industries. Uh, in many ways, um, the plus side of what the interconnectedness of the world through the internet, uh, all the revolutionary things that have been incredibly impactful in terms of moving us forward. Uh, we're now learning about the dark side. 
and it's pretty ugly. And what we see every day uh, against our institutions, against our military, against our financial services, against our critical infrastructure, stretching from those who have major capabilities of doing this, starting with Russia, including China, maybe for a different purpose, stealing our innovations. Um, and their intent, I think, is different than the Russians. Um, add Iran into, into that. Add ISIS into that. Here we thought, so we started, we first learned about ISIS when uh, they started slicing off heads. And we identified ISIS as a seventh century barbarism uh, that was just totally unacceptable. And where did this come from? And where did this theology come from? At the same time they were slicing off heads, they were operating a sophisticated cyber program to reach out to recruit people, to give them instructions, inspire them to take acts, to join this movement, this jihadist movement through some incapable, I mean, very capable ways um, of using cyber, sophisticated ways. And so you see the danger that cyber can provide um, if you do it in nefarious ways. Um, we see that, you know, it's everything from a, uh, a sophisticated nation with a lot of capabilities to rogue states, to criminal organizations, to a kid sitting in his dorm room that can wreak havoc on our economy, wreak havoc on our country, uh, on our critical infrastructure. Um, we are throwing everything we have at it to prevent that from happening. But it has become, in my mind, and what I stated in the threat assessments, um, uh, up there at the top. And we need to understand that. I was worried about a complacency. Oh, you know, every day you hear uh, 120 million people's names have been snatched from the Equifax or this or that or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they've probably got stuff from you and from through your phone. You should be changing your password every week. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I can't remember a password anyway, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a complacency and an acceptance of what's happening out there that, well, this is just what it is. This is just the result of it. And so I'm concerned about, you, know, you say, what, what do you worry at night? I'm concerned about a cyber 9-11. What, what would that look like? Well, let's say you shut down Wall Street for a week. What does that do to world markets and people's investments? Let's say you uh, crash a um, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whatever, and all of a sudden people are saying, hey, wait a minute, what happened to my account? What happened to my retirement? Oh, we'll get it back, okay. Well, we've seen this, and we've seen coverage of that. We haven't seen the big one. Um, what about an attack on the electric grid in New England in January that maybe is sophisticated enough to take it out for three days? How many people will die from, uh, 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 from minus degree weather on that? I mean, those are the things that I think you have to look, you have to try to anticipate what are the capabilities that our adversaries now have if they wanted to use them. And as Charlie Allen, who in my mind is a legend, and uh, I look to him for advice uh, on regular breakfast. Um, I won't tell you where we meet. But um, uh, these are things I think strategically we have to look forward. Um, Tom Clancy's sum of all fears, when a terrorist group obtains a weapon of mass destruction. If a weapon of mass destruction had been, been one of those airliners that uh, hit the Twin Towers, we wouldn't be talking about 3,000 victims. We'd be talking about 300,000 victims or more. And so these are the things we have to think about. We can't rest on our laurels that, yes, we collect a lot of information. We all know what's going on. There are people out there playing this game of chess with us in ways that are, want to take us down. And we have to be better than they. Uh, and that is a huge challenge, and which was why I say it's a whole of government effort that has to take place relative to cyber. Yet the White House <clears throat> fired its cyber coordinator and has not replaced him. Mm. And is the president <clears throat> really engaged in mm. this? Because if the president is not leading the charge, Will the troops really try to take the hill? Well, as you know, we have a new national security advisor, John Bolton. Uh, John Bolton made the decision to make a change relative to uh, uh, who was handling that at the, at the White House level. Um, the, uh, uh, John Bolton is putting in place uh, the replacements for that. It is a key, it's ensured me uh, that that is a key issue that we need to address. 
in the meantime, this is dis uh, spread throughout our various agencies, uh, each one somewhat different than the other, taking major steps. We have fusion centers, we have processes underway. Uh, Kirsten Nielsen basically uh, said, told you about what uh, DHS is doing. Uh, Defense is doing that. Uh, all of our agencies are, are engaged in that. This is gonna continue to ramp up, um, and uh, it involves not just uh, tampering with the election, but it involves putting the right defenses in place, the right strategies in place in terms of how to retaliate if necessary. Um, it's, it's clearly one of our top priorities. Last week you said Russia and other actors were exploring vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure and trying to infiltrate energy, water, nuclear, and manufacturing sectors. These actions are persistent, they are pervasive, and they are meant to undermine America's democracy. Have they succeeded? And have you found penetrations in areas? Well, uh, sure. I mean, we see, we see, all you have to do is pick up the paper and see who was the latest hack, successful hack. And so there are, are those penetrations those from criminal in syndicates or, they, or those foreign actors? Uh, from any number of, and attribution is one of the problems that we have. You just, you know, you're not lining up tanks and planes here um, and, and see where the enemy is. You don't know exactly where it's coming from. We have capabilities to determine that, but, but um, uh, that takes some pretty good statecraft uh, in order to define that. So yes, this is something that is, that is broad and we see it coming from all different sources. Criminal organizations can use it. You see the stealing of Bitcoin, you see the stealing of money. Um, North Korea is pretty famous for its capabilities to gain revenue by hacking uh, financial institutions. So it's everywhere. Are you seeing any evidence of increased Iranian aggression, uh, perhaps in response to the American sanctions and the withdrawal from the nuclear deal? Well, nothing of major impact, but we see continuous malign uh, efforts by the Iranians, uh, which was a lot of what drove the decision on the Jigpoa, um, was the what we thought originally, or what we were told originally. When I was serving in the Senate, the narrative was um, we'll have a much better relationship with Iranians, we'll be able to talk to them about some of the things that they're doing, have a more cooperative effort, and so forth. That did not happen. We saw them step up their, their game in terms of support for uh, uh, terrorist groups, uh, in terms of their malign activities, their missile development, a whole range of others, their involvement in, in Damascus and Syria, their involvement in Yemen, on and on it went. They're firing rockets at our boats in the, in the Gulf. Um, uh, they're bad actors, uh, and they continue to be bad actors. So um, there we are. North Korea. As you know, some of our own intelligence officials have told NBC News that North Korea is enriching nuclear fuel at secret sites, is making plans to deceive the United States about its nuclear program, uh, even as we are discussing denuclearization at the summit level. How does that square with the president's declaration in Singapore that they are denuclearizing? Well, I think it was you referring to they're going to denuclearize. They've made a commitment to de denuclearize. Mike Pompeo, who I just talked with the other day, basically said they continue to make that statement. I'm a Reagan guy, came to office in 1980 with Ronald Reagan, trust and verify. Um, I'm now the verify guy. Um, um, I still have a real hard time trusting uh, our adversaries. Uh, I'm not surprised the North Koreans that might be trying to hide some things, try to be deceptive. Uh, that's why we have the verification process and we'll need the verification process in place to absolutely ensure that they they, this is classic North Korean uh, uh, deflection. Uh, we expected that. Um, I think we have the right person in the right place, Mike Pompeo there, um, coming out of the CIA. We know, uh, and we have the capability to know what they're doing, and we're gonna make sure we do it right. Is there any evidence, any intelligence assessment that North Korea is prepared to give up its nuclear weapons? Well, it depends on your evaluation of the Supreme Leader there, that uh, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, continues to uh, say, and some of his people continue to reassert. Um, but time will tell. I mean, I don't think we should go forward with the assumption uh, that all this is gonna work. 
Um, but having the opportunity to try to succeed here instead of potentially going to war with a potentially nuclear armed nation and what we evaluated as somewhat unstable leader, um, why not give it a shot? Uh, we have the support from the Chinese. Uh, the sanctions are basically being held. Um, the uh, amount of uh, exports uh, going out of North Korea has declined dramatically. Um, Kim Jong-un is uh, forced to look at a uh, potential collapse of his economy if he can't do, do something uh, moving forward with this. And so I think we have some leverage here. We continue to have Chinese support. We continue to have Russian support on, on exporting and other nations, South Korea and others. And so right now, we have the pressure on them uh, to go forward and we'll just see how it plays out. But again, I said, trust and verify. Um, I, I think I'm starting with don't put in trust until you see the results and make sure you verify what they are. Is, how do you continue the so-called maximum pressure through sanctions when we have, in effect, normalized Kim Jong-un through a summit with an American president? Uh, is it likely that China and Russia will continue to adhere to these sanctions? I think Russia and China see the danger of North Korea being a nuclear armed nation. Um, um, they have sided with us in this regard. Um, we you know, obviously will be watching uh, what happens. All I can say is what we know today is that they are adhering to the sanctions program and we will continue uh, to assess that. I would say um, um, one of the uh, issues here is the coal is coal and oil. Uh, that their ability to import that has dropped dramatically, and that hurts them economically. There are ship-to-ship -ship transfers that it's been hard to interdict, uh, and so they are gaining some uh, uh, energy uh, from those ship-to-ship -ship transfers out in the water somewhere uh, in some sea uh, vessels that have been, uh, you know, given a different signal and so forth and so on. Um, but that is uh, not as so substantive that it is that it has bypassed the ability for them to to see the consequences of sanctions. You said you're the verify guy. We've always been told that North Korea is the hardest target, it intelligence is. target, with so much mm -hmm. underground. How yeah. good is our intel? How how well do we assess their weapons? Significantly better than it was. We saw the threat. We knew we had to step up. We have taken significant measures to do so and we are in a much better position, and we will continue to pursue getting even better position. We have to if we're gonna go through with this process. They managed to cheat and fool two previous presidents <sighs> yeah. in both parties. Yeah, well, let's try to make sure we, that doesn't happen again. Uh, John Bolton suggested that one year was a timeline for them to denuclearize. Uh, is there any scenario where they could denuclearize in one year? It's technically possible, but probably not uh, uh, going to happen. Uh, I think Secretary uh, Pompeo has clearly said this is hard. This is going to take some time. Uh, he has projected uh, a longer time frame. But then it depends on what steps they take within that one period of time that can give us some hope and, cur and encouragement uh, that we're on the right track. But uh, it's, it's a much more complicated process than most people think. I want to ask you about the president's daily brief, the intelligence brief, mm -hmm. the PDB. Um, how frequently does he get the intelligence brief? It hasn't been on his schedule on a regular basis lately. Uh, lately, he's been doing a lot of travel. Uh, there was an Oval Office this morning. There's going to be one tomorrow morning. My principal deputy will be representing me, has represented me this morning, will represent me tomorrow. Uh, there have been some, there were some early cancellations within the last two weeks because there's an awful lot of travel planning and, and so forth. But um, they, they are relatively regular based on the president's travel. Now, when he travels, he has a briefer that goes with him that comes from out of our shop, um, putting together the PDB. And so that briefer then briefs the travel, the president on weekends uh, if he's not in Washington and also briefs him when he travels. So just because it wasn't an oval, if he's overseas, he's still getting 
briefs. And if it's a weekend, he's still getting briefs. What kind of consumer is he of intelligence? Every president takes it differently. Some read, like to lead, read the brief, some mm -hmm. like it uh, orally. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the He likes the it orally. Uh, he likes examples. Um, we have, uh, I have introduced him to directors of our various intelligence agencies for them to come in and present, here's what we do, Mr. President. Here's some of the crown jewels. Here's what uh, we really are proud of. of uh, um, and so we've, we've given that information to him. Um, he uh, wants an oral uh, presentation, but we use models, we use charts, we use a number of things. I, it, going back and looking at uh, post uh, accounts of post briefers, uh, previous briefers, every president takes it a different way. Some of them want to read every word by themselves and say, I don't need a brief. Uh, I've read it all. You, all you can do is tell me. Others say, no, I, I, you know, give me the three most important things here. I've skimmed through this and so forth. I don't have time for more. Others have said, but with this president, we have consistently gone over time. Consistently, Madeline comes to the door, Mr. President, you're behind time. I need more time. So he does ask a lot of questions. He does have a lot of curiosity. What he does with that information, of course, is whatever president does. I mean, they, they evaluate that in context with all the infra, other information that is provided to them by their staff and their own thinking. And so our job is to give them the raw stuff, the basics, knowing that that's going to be a part of a broader set of information that comes to the president and advice that comes to the president relative to the final decisions that he makes. It occurs to me, did you know beforehand that Kislyak and Lavrov, the ambassador and the foreign minister, were going into the Oval Office that day? I did not. What was your reaction afterwards? I mean, we all learned about it from Tess. Uh, probably not the best thing to do. Um, but no, I, I was not aware of that. I, I don't think, I, I, I'm not aware of anything like that since. I have to understand, you have a president who can't, did not come through the system, uh, came from the outside. Um, I don't think there was any nefarious attempt there to do anything, um, but um, that's history. Had, have incidents like that hurt relationships with other intelligence agencies on sharing data information? You know, um, I spend a lot of time interacting with our allies and even with our adversaries on the intelligence level. What I tell them is, look, we have, even though we may have major issues with which we disagree in policy, it's very important. We all have the same basic responsibility of keeping our people safe. To the extent that we can work together for this and this alone, ought to bind us together. And we have formed very trusted relationships with people saying, we know there's a lot of political stuff swirling around up there. But our responsibility is to keep our people safe. So if we can share with each other, and we really have rest restored and retained a lot of very good relationships where we just kind of put the news of the day on a shelf and say, what's happening in terms of terrorist threats, counterintelligence, et cetera, making sure we get the right information shared with each other. A perfect example of that is when we notified Vladimir Putin that we had information about an attack about to occur very quickly in St. Petersburg, where dozens if not hundreds of people could have been killed. Um, we asked, um, and I frankly, uh, I had met with their directors. I said, I'm, I'm only here to talk about protecting our people. If we don't agree on anything else, um, can we agree that if we see a threat to our people, or to your people, you will reciprocate with what we're doing, reciprocate in order to stop an attack from happening. Um, and that is a foundational thing that I think is very, very important, and we have to keep our focus on that. Do you have that kind of relationship with other adversarial intelligence agencies? Um, Basically, it's allies, people. Now, you have to assume the level of trust here. So you just don't go walk in with the crown jewels. Right. You don't go walk in with anything except 
counterterrorism only. Hey, we're here for one reason and one reason why I'm not getting into anything else you do. Now, with our five eyes, with our key partners, of course, it's a whole different relationship. And uh, we have trust that we can share our information on a whole number of things. Um, but there's a sharp, very sharp line that when you, when you step over to somebody where, you know, um, not sure about this one, uh, you just, you don't go anywhere past the CT. How good is the Mossad to have gone into the center of Tehran and gotten into that building and taken all of that data about their nuclear program? Yeah. Well, the Israelis, um, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. <laughs> <laughs> and they certainly bragged about it. Uh, I want to ask, well, I also ask you about uh, a real red line that was crossed with the um, the nerve agent that was used in the UK. Mm -hmm. And today, the Brits are reporting that CCTV cameras picked up possible suspects in right. that case. Um, what is the risk that such action could be taken, such targeted killings could be taken against defectors or other assets here in the US? Oh, it's a risk. I mean, the, the Russians uh, do bold things and uh, extraordinary things. Uh, the pushback that uh, we had with a combination of, of our uh, partners uh, against Russia on this was, was very, very important, sending the right signal. But it should have told the world uh, that if you, if you think the Russians are uh, trying to be good neighbors, uh, this is the kind of things they still do. And by the way, the former director of the KGB um, is the one leading their nation. And those people usually don't have the kind of training that uh, our presidents have. So again, we should be very wary around the former KGB leader who is leading their nation. A lot of things point to, look, I mean, it's, it, I think anybody who thinks that Vladimir Putin doesn't have his stamp on everything that happens in Russia is, is, is misinformed. Um, it is very clear that virtually nothing happens there of any kind of consequence that Vladimir Putin doesn't know about or hasn't ordered. I think we're pretty sure about that. The threats to the 2018 midterms, how well defended are we in terms of state election boards? There was a report in Maryland that yep. one of the contractors working on the uh, election board was actually partly owned by a Russian oligarch. Yeah. And that's a success. We're now learning what is happening out there and doing everything we can to correct it. There is an all of government effort. So we will hear things, and that's good, because we want to hear things that are, if they're happening, so that we can correct it. And so between now and the election, we're, we just need to do, sure the American people, we're doing absolutely everything we can to make this a clean election. I think we benefit from that. As you know, I won't sort out any, I mean, both parties. There have been elections in places where we've had our own people messing with the, with the result. Um, so uh, the, the, the double benefit of this is that if we can put those protections in against outsiders trying to interfere inside, we can also have a much better reliable system for insiders to try to manip manipulate that. We have to assure the American people that we have a sound system. It, it's the essence of democracy. The intelligence community has been under pretty sharp political attack from all sides. Some of it from the Oval Office, but not all of it. Um, had there been, have there been moments, such as those suggested by Christopher Wray in his interview with Lester Holt, where you even considered resigning? That's a place I don't really go to uh, publicly. I mean, every, you know, I, uh, I've tried to retire twice. Uh, not very successfully. And not successfully. I failed both times. But um, look, you, you, you ask yourself, why did you agree to do this in the first place? What is your intent? And what is your responsibility? And I look at those measures in terms of making decisions as to how long I would like to be in this business. Are there days when you think, well, what am I doing? Um, yeah, but there's a lot more days saying, you know, um, the mission here is critical, and to be able to be a part of it, be able to feel like you're giving something back to your country, um, 
um, uh, it's a reward. Uh, that's not a, necessarily a financial reward, but it's a reward that uh, doesn't come from just uh, uh, a softer, softer job or, or, or more income. Uh, so I, I just, uh, as long as I'm able to have the ability uh, to uh, seek the truth and speak the truth, uh, I'm on board. You were a member, please. You were a member of the Senate, and I, I covered Congress in years past with legendary members of both parties. Yeah. Uh, the American public is pretty turned off on Congress, the stalemate, That's for sure. the, the <laughs> level of debate. Um, what is your response in, in looking at it from the outside now and as someone who was there during uh, some of the glory days? Yeah. You know, I, I had the unusual uh, situation where I served two different times in the United States Senate. The first time, um, uh, it's like having a foot in what the Senate traditionally had been, yeah. and then another foot in what the Senate has become now. And my first stint uh, there, there was bipartisan, I mean, look, we had different opinions but we worked them out, and we reached a conclusion. And speak, we had terrific leadership. Uh, Bob Dole, George Mitchell, uh, had, a, I think, a very successful relationship, even though we were on different page policy-wise and so forth, in using a process to come to a conclusion. Everybody had a chance to offer their amendments. Uh, I can't remember how many times George Mitchell would say, I know you all want to go home, but nobody's going home until we finish this bill. Now, I know there's 113 amendments still out there. Now, if you want to tell your colleagues that you need to stay here Saturday and Sunday, that's fine. As soon as you guys want to say, let's vote, uh, then we'll adjourn. And I think we've lost that now, uh, partly for, from a procedural standpoint, partly because there's just so much animosity uh, between uh, the two groups. Um, things have been accomplished. Um, but I think it could be a much better atmosphere uh, if we could get some kind of comity in terms of how we work with each other. You talked about sticking it out, and, and you don't talk about threatening to resign. I, I respect that. You have fears that if you were not there, someone would replace you who does not stand up for an independent intelligence community free of politics. Well, I don't think I should base my my decisions uh, on that, I, I, I assume they would reach, there's plenty of people out there that can uh, do a good job on this. I came from the outside, uh, not from inside the intelligence community. There, there are skills and knowledge that I don't have. Um, I, I got some really smart people surrounding me that do have that experience. It allows me to have more interaction with things that I have had experience with, like going before Congress, working with the Congress, working within the executive branch and so forth. And even on for be, having had a diplomatic experience as ambassador, that's very helpful to me and something I can bring with that experience to the job. And so hopefully we're trying to find that right blend uh, of mix, and I, I hope we have. We can only imagine what keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've been a diplomat and twice a senator. What are the joys of this job? <laughs> Uh, the joy is not a word that I have come across. <laughs> People say, are you having fun? I said, what are you talking about? You <laughs> this is not a fun job. Uh, I said, it's a meaningful job, uh, but it's not fun. Uh, you know, you wake up every morning, you know, and you, I sit down with my senior uh, intelligence uh, mission people, and I say, you know, it's sort of like, okay, tell me the bad things that happened since I fell asleep. Uh, I'm, I'm flooded with, with uh, documents and so are the uh, top secret and so forth and so on. Classified documents every day and I'm, all, I'm reading about what went wrong. I don't get to read about what went right. That's why I grabbed the sports page from the Washington Post <laughs> hoping the Chicago Cubs had won <laughs> last night. Uh, because, and then the day goes down from there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, no, I mean, it's... it's it's not fun. Uh, you don't get joy. 
but it's a reward for being involved in a mission that is part of trying to help your country. I just don't think people can understand how privileged we are to be born in this country, to live in this country. I mean, we look at our problems, and you look at the world's problems. I mean, we are blessed. And we've got to make sure people understand that, because for all the bickering and stuff that's going on, there's never been a country like this. There's never been a place where you have this kind of opportunity. And we've got to preserve that. We have to do everything we can to preserve it. And being asked, would you help us do that? That's something that's really special. Well, on that note, <laughs> I, um, I want to thank you for your service uh, three times. We have time for some questions. I do want to say we have some breaking news. The White House has announced on Twitter that Vladimir Putin is coming to the White House in the fall. Say or that again. <laughs> <laughs> you. Vladimir Putin coming Did I to hear the, you? Did I hear you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be special. <laughs> <laughs> We're up here without any devices or communication. So um, let me look around the room, uh, see some friendly faces. Jane Harmon, do you have your voice back today? Uh, head, sort of, yeah, I do. Trustee and the head of the National Security Forum here. Yeah, well, thank you for your service, Dan, in, in three jobs, and your courage in this job especially. Thank you. My question is about uh, North Korea. You said that um, uh, their economy is really shattering, and my question is, what is the risk that they will proliferate missile technology, which they surely have, yeah. to rogue actors? And Jane, that's a very relevant question because, as you know, um, they have uh, earned a lot of cash selling their weapons of mass destruction technologies and weapons. We have to absolutely make sure that this is not part of anything that we allow to happen. We have to make sure that we put all the verification processes in place to not make that happen. But yes, they have gained a lot of revenue uh, by selling those materials and shifting, in, shifting those around to bad actors, and we can't let that happen. Okay, Josh Rogan. Is there a mic? Thank you very much, Josh Rogan, Washington Post. Um, yesterday, Christopher Wray said, quote, China, from a counterintelligence perspective, represents the broadest, most pervasive, most threatening challenge we face as a country. Do you agree with that assessment? If so, is the US government dedicating proportional and sufficient resources to confronting that threat? If we're not dedicating those resources, why not? And don't you think we ought to? Well, first of all, I agree with it. I had dinner last night with Chris, and I said I really appreciated, uh, I thought you were very articulate, and so forth. And he said, yeah, I just read what you said at Hudson, and I just repeated it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I fully agree with what he said. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, countering that, um, I think we're becoming ever more aware of what the Chinese are trying to do. It's a different intent than, of course, what the Russians are trying to do. Um, but uh, I think we clearly are, China is being called out on that. It is an issue of significant discussion uh, and strategy thinking in terms of how we best do that. Um, we currently are in a trade situation. I'm glad I'm not the trade representative. Don't ask me a question about uh, trade or quotas or tariffs or whatever. I had opinions when I was in the United States Senate, but I'm just burying those now. I'll uh, leave that to someone else. Uh, but yes, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's how we look at China. We look at China in a different way than we look at, look at Russia. Uh, I think they do have different intents. Uh, China wants to be a, a global power. And you see them spreading their influence, uh, this one belt, one road. You see them spreading their influence, whether it's the, the, the coral islands or whether it's uh, strategic ports and so forth. Um, they've got a long-term strategy. And we're going to have to adjust to that. We're going to have to make a decision on whether or not they are a true adversary or whether they're a legitimate competitor. 
And how are we going to work with that? One thing, I mean, there are several things that we need to do, I think, immediately, and that is, look, you cannot steal our secrets. If you, fine, if you want to innovate, innovate. But don't send your kids here. Don't put your people in our labs. Don't take cyber stealing of our innovation and, our, and so forth. We're not going to allow that. And so I think that's where we begin drawing the line. I think it's a blend. Uh, it depends on how you look at it and, and what you see their intent is. And different people look at it at different ways. Uh, they clearly are a competitor, becoming a competitor. They've made remarkable uh, strides in the last five, six years or so. Um, uh, they do some adversarial things, uh, but it's not the type of things that, uh, that the Russians do. But Jeremy. Jeremy Bash, Beacon Global Strategies. Uh, Mr. Director, first, thanks for your leadership of the intelligence community. Thank you. Um, and I actually would like everyone to applaud the director's leadership and his outstanding service to our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question about Russia also. Was the game plan going into Helsinki to potentially confront the Russians on their violations of the INF Treaty? Mm -hmm. And also, relatedly, on arms control, do you assess or do we assess that the Russians would be interested in having an arms control agreement to actually continue some of the reductions in levels of nuclear weapons? Uh, we know that that issue was discussed in the meeting. I don't know what came from it or what the details are. I think it's something that, that we should go forward with. Uh, if Russia wants to be the country that they say they want to be, they have to be the could act in a way that uh, reaches that goal. Uh, so it's their actions and not their words uh, that matter. Uh, their actions have been pretty nefarious uh, toward us. So we'll see where that goes. I don't have high hopes on that, but um, I hope, it, I would wish we could sit down and talk about that. Ambassador Bernstein. Dan, I'm a fan of yours too. Well, we served together uh, yeah. at an interesting time. Great. Uh, we know Iran supports uh, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, are there any other of uh, those kind of uh, organizations that we should know about, if you call them organizations, that Iran is supporting? Well, you name the big ones, but Iran is looking around, you know, obviously they're, they're uh, supporting the Houthis in, in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, they're looking for opportunities to uh, mess with us in different ways uh, in, in Syria. You know, it's interesting, this, um, uh, I think it's Tom Friedman put this piece in the, uh, the New York Times uh, two or three weeks ago about the potential for conflict in uh, southwestern Syria, right on the border of Israel, right on the Golan Heights, the uh, border that uh, we've got um, in, in eastern Syria, or western Syria, we have about four, five, six nations conflicting and so forth. We have U.S. troops uh, a, little further, a little further east, but um, uh, the, the possibility of, of mistake, possibility of uh, wrong assumptions uh, can really trigger something there. So it's a, it's a real hot spot. We don't talk much about it. So much going on with, with everything. Um, we don't talk much about it, but that's a real worry for us. Um, and we, the Iranians have said, have stated publicly, they're not going to allow Iranian um, uh, in influence uh, in that part of the world uh, that, that, close to, that close to their borders. Uh, and they're going to take action. And we read almost every day they, have ta they are taking action. Um, so you have, you have quite a stew uh, of a mess uh, right there in a very critical part of the world that uh, yeah, the wrong spark uh, could create a major problem. And, and the Iranian presidents, presence is uh, a key factor. I think Carol Lee is in the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, the White House announcement that Andrea referenced earlier said Putin was invited to Washington this fall. Were you aware of that? Just want to clarify, because you I didn't think seem I'm, to be. Based on my reaction, I wasn't aware of that. OK. Uh, <laughs> given that, what, would, what do you think the agenda should be for that meeting? Oh, goodness. Um, I, 
uh, you know, I, I, they're not gonna, first of all, they're not gonna ask me what the agenda is. Um, um, we will be looking at what the potential uh, intelligence risk uh, could possibly be, and we'll make that information known to the president, and we'll provide him with whatever information we can gather relative to what might be on Putin's mind or what they might want to achieve. But, um, you know, hey, we're, what, 15, 20 minutes into this uh, breaking news uh, about this, so I think it's uh, uh, something we'll just have to assess going forward. Well, would you recommend that there not be a one-on-one -on -one without note-takers? If I were asked that question, uh, I would uh, yeah, look for a, a, a different way of doing it. All right. I think we're just about out of time. Um, Michael Gordon, one final question. I know you can do it quickly. It's always that final question that gets you. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Do you think Russia has uh, sufficient uh, influence in Syria to uh, force Iranian um, military forces and Iranian-backed militias to vacate the country, since that's a poli policy objective of some of the administration? Just from an analytical intelligence perspective. We have, we have assessed that it's unlikely Russia has the will or the capability to fully implement um, uh, and counter uh, Iranian decisions in, in an influence. Uh, it's, a, it's a big country. Uh, there are a lot of hot spots there. Russia would have to make significantly greater commitments from a military standpoint, from an economic standpoint. Um, we don't assess that they are keen to do that. Well, thank you and the men and women of the agencies for everything that you do.